Okay, we ready? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Ready, right. Um, in the weeks before this conference, Monica sent out a list of things that you're supposed to do if you're going to give a talk. And one of the things was you should spend 15 hours on your talk and you should rehearse it with somebody and you should submit an abstract and a title. Uh, the abstract and title bit was difficult because the talk was finished, well, it was finished about 20 minutes ago. It's uh, the third uh, title I've seen. I yeah, think. it's the third title. And um, I didn't spend 15 hours on the talk. Spent, what we spent, an hour? Two hours. To be honest, Joe, I did come to your house on Tuesday. Yeah. So we've had a few days to yeah, play around. We've had a few days. Uh, I spent about 40 years, or 45 <laughs> or 50 years, thinking about the problem and about an hour thinking about the talk. And uh, so we'll see what we've come up with. So, Absolutely. so um, this is conference driven development. Sam and I meet up at conferences and, and then they say, Can you give a talk? And we think, Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, then what usually happens is, what always happens to me, is you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then about two weeks before the conference, you look in at my Google calendar. Oh, no, four weeks before, because you've got to book the flight. That's the first warning. <laughs> and they say, oh, what flight do you want to? I don't know. <gasps> oh, my God, am I going to go to a conference? Oh, shit. Well, you're lucky this one. You actually live in Stockholm. Oh, yeah, this one's easy. Yeah. And, and, then, um, <laughs> and then you Google your name and conference. <laughs> And you find you're in America or somewhere like that, and then you Google the title and abstract, and, and then you write the talk. So this is called conference-driven development. Now, now this particular talk, uh, Sam uh, and I were going to talk, and we thought we needed a bit of time, so I invited Sam to come and stay with me, and he'd been camped out uh, for a while. I was only allowed in that small corner for the entire yeah. duration. And, 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 and and Helen's lovely, my wife. I mean, she's <laughs> very forgiving. I said, it's all, right. it's all right if Sam leaves all his synthesizers all over the carpet. And she said, oh, yeah, no problem. So, so it's all right, wasn't it? That's fine. Yeah, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. Leave the carpet. Yeah, and I, and I keep saying, there's no such thing as too many synthesizers. So and she's used to it a bit. So this is us uh, earlier in the week. Uh, and then, uh, well, this is, this is... Somebody filmed this yesterday. So, so this is kind of fun. Um, it was sweet. So this is cool. Watch the panic. Ready for the panic? It's going to come. Because <laughs> I was kind of twisting these knobs and then I had to write a program. I, oh, I don't know what to write, so, so goodness. Now this, this demo is, sorry, demo. This, this is a talk with a lot of sound in it. And, and uh, I haven't done live demos for years after. Bjarne will remember the demo we did. That was, that went, that went so catastrophically wrong that, that we never ever did a demo ever again. And, and uh, it kind of... Uh, well, burnt you. So it burnt me, yes. And, uh, and so a uh, little bit about Sonic Pi, which, which I'm working with and, and which we're doing. It's got fantastic semantics. It's a wonderful program. And it's, Sam's written it all. It's got a large user base. It's got a simple user interface. And it's... Com for me, the, the big thing about it is component-based. Um, we met up at, at Strange Loop, and I liked Sonic Pi, and I said, um, it would be great if I could remote control it. And Sam said, you can remote control it. All you have to do is send an OSC message to your UDP encoded OSC message to port 4557. Four, 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 five, five, and I said, what, what the hell is OSC? Never heard of it. And he said, it's open sound control. So I Googled a little bit, found a GitHub open sound control implementation in Erlang, downloaded it, and sent a message to I said, what's the message? And he said, well, slash run, play 60. And it played a note. It played boop, which is a, a 60. And I went, wow, that's fantastic. I, I could control his program with about two or three lines of code, which took me five minutes to write, uh, including the time to search the net and download the program. And I thought, that's fantastic. And, and then I said, well, why, why didn't you document how you use it? And he said, well, Sam, I sat and documented. The most important thing about your program, you haven't documented. Well, because the, actually that's the internals, because the Sonic Pi is built for kids to learn how to program and using network protocols. But don't you teach UDP to the kids? As not, the yet, not yet, not oh, yet. No, no. Okay. It's not in the curriculum. Like sequencing, conditionals, you know, like iteration. Right, and then UDP. Later, yes. Later, yeah, later, right. that's, that's the second. <laughs> that's the second week. So they're introducing the UDP when they're about seven or eight or something like that. So that's it's easy to learn. Threads, after threads. And, and it's programmed in Ruby. Well, it's not just programmed in Ruby. The Sonic Pi distribution 
hidden inside its, it's quite big, hidden inside its directory structure is a complete Ruby and the complete version of the program called the, the Super Collider. And as of the next version, as of the next version, the complete month. version of Erlang, which is kind of hidden inside the distribution. So anybody gets the Sonic Fire distribution gets an Erlang. And not only that, Erlang is now, or will be, will be, yeah. <laughs> installed in Raspbian. All yeah, due to me. Sorry, you. <laughs> you, me. Yes. So this is, the fir this is the first time that Erlang will be distributed inside the Sonic Pi standard distribution, and it's thanks to Sam that that's happened. The Raspberry Pi distribution, yeah. And the Raspberry Pi Institute. So I would like you to tweet that, because I was talking to people, and he didn't bother to mention it to me or anybody. So I, you know, this is a great news. And I was talking to people, that, that will in its turn enable Alexia applications and any other Erlang applications to be quickly ported onto the, onto the Raspberry Pi. Without having to do app get install. Uh, yeah, app, yes. Right, so there we go. That's Perfect. really good. And inside Sonic Pi, it's programmed in this weird programming language called Ruby. Or, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a funny language. It's lovely, yeah. It's got variables. It's got variables. Yeah, it's got state Yeah. everywhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and everywhere. And mutexes and locks Every, yeah, and, yeah. and race conditions uh, and lovely. thread lovely. unsafety and all these kinds all of... All the fun stuff. Is it thread safe? Sorry? Thread safe. Ruby. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Capital T and S. Yeah, right, yeah. okay. So, <laughs> so I got kind of involved in this, and, 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 and we started off just doing some simple things. I, I wrote a scheduler which takes care of, of, of timing future events and gave it to Sam. I didn't actually know he was using it, and then Sam was showing me last night when we were doing this gig that, that my scheduler was doing those beats and things. So, so I said, that's cool. That's what we're using Erlang for. I'll yeah. explain that later. Yes. Okay, so Sonic Pi. Sonic Pi is something that's got semantics, um, but not syntax, not a language. The, langu the language to express these semantics in is Ruby, and the semantics are things that Sam has discovered in building it. And so Sam's been reinventing the wheel. And I don't know if he knows he's been reinvented the wheel. So, so what Sam has put into Sonic Pi are Linda tuple spaces. Do you know about Linda? Absolutely, Linda yeah, yeah. Spaces? So, you know about Linda tuple spaces? Okay, so when I interviewed Alan Kay, I said, what was the best idea that was floating around, you know, in the 80s or the 70s uh, that we've forgotten about? And he, he said one of these things was Linda tuple spaces. So if you think about it, Erlang and Alexia, to send a message to a process, you need to know the name of the process you're sending it to. You need to know the identity of the process. Then the tuple space is abstract from that with whiteboard abstraction. You just send a message, but you don't need to send it to anybody in particular. It will be, you know, if anybody happens to be listening for that type of message, it will receive it. So it, lay it makes it one, one stage of abstraction simpler. And it's a very nice declarative abstraction. And what, uh, what Sam had done is use Linda tuple spaces uh, to match on patterns that, that trigger music samples. Oh, and he didn't know they were Linda Super Spaces. And he'd also done Thing Lab. Thing, did, does anybody remember Thing Lab? Thing Lab, done in small talk back in the 80s. It, it was a language with, with live controls in. Uh, and he'd, he'd invented that as well. And he'd invented Erlang like scheduling. He was just about getting around to, to inventing error recovery oh, yeah, when absolutely. he discovered that there was a language that already could do this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right. I mean, uh, it's also important to point out that um, it's not about reinventing the wheel. Um, Sonic Pi, because it's for teaching kids how to program, it has to pass what I call the teacher test. So teachers come up to me and say, what on earth is this system you've built? What language is it? Why is it not Python? <laughs> and that's the, uh, that's the discussion you have to have. It's not about which is the best language, what the right semantics are, what industry is using, or anything that's actually a valuable discussion you might have outside. It's about convincing this head teacher who knows nothing about programming why it's not Python. And so Ruby is actually quite an easy argument to have because it's obviously very close to Python and you can say things like Twitter was built in Ruby, which of course is no longer built into Ruby, but uh, enough to say that, they go, oh, right, that's, that must be good then, you know? And so <laughs> it's not, it, this is about social arguments rather than practical uh, 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 computer science-like arguments. So right. that's why it's in Ruby. So, so Sam's built this wonderful thing, it's got this wonderful semantics, and I kind of like fiddling around with programming languages and abstractions and think, well, can I, can I describe this in a, in a slightly different way that's slightly more convenient? Because I don't want to describe things in Ruby, that's horrible. 
So, so I'm looking at the semantics of programming language that, can, that can be used to describe music. And, and I thought, until Sam came on Monday, that music was a language for describing discrete events. And, and, and so Joe's got a piano at home, that's his musical instrument. It's, so it's a discrete event machine. When you play a piano note, you know, it's got an on and off. You play it and you lift your finger off it, and you can't control it after, afterwards. You know, if you play a violin, you go and you, do you do some vibrato? Uh, oh, I know, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, and he said, oh, you don't just do a note on and a note off, you do all these controller changes in between. I thought, oh, golly. So I thought my language that I've made, Muslang to mu music language version two on Sunday before he came, I thought I'd better do a version three. It's like Erlang, I used to be able to completely rewrite the Erlang system in a day. So Muslang two is in this state, I can completely rewrite it in a few hours. So, um, so I thought, this is a language which needs variables, which are knob variables. So, so, so here's a knob variable. M most languages have got like int x, that's a static type, uh, as in a language like C, you declare that x is a... <laughs> that no, it wasn't me, no. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't vibrate, vibrate. Where's that going? Oh, well, that's good for that one. <laughs> well, vibrato is... What wobble your knob? It's not very, it's not very loud, is it? You keep talking, Joe. Well, never mind. Okay, so, so we've got, yeah, we've got languages. We can say int x, and that's a static type. And then you've got languages like Erlang. X can have any type. And then you have languages x. You don't give the type, but it can be inferred. A language like, like Haskell. Uh, but we don't want a declaration like int x. We want a, 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 an annotation like knob x because it means that it's going to be wobbled, right? And then in your program, you could say, I want to play a musical note, I want to play a C-sharp for a particular duration and at a particular volume. So, so I'd have to declare my variables, play C-sharp duration x, volume y, where x and y are knobs. Yeah, very good. So, we, so I'd like a programming language. Does this do anything? No. Where this would be a variable in your program, and you just control it. I also want a programming language that I can compose music with. So, uh, music. So, what is music? It's instruments like piano, it's discrete events. It's important to say, what is music to Joe? It's not like a de definite description of all music. This is not the definition you will find in a course in music and musicology. It's my own definition. <laughs> and violin is kind of, kind of continuous events. And then I was going to, before solving the problem, I want to kind of frame encapsulate in the problem of what problem am I trying to solve. So one problem I'm trying to do is multi-level multi problem. It's a difficult problem. See, I, I, I was retired a couple of years ago. So now instead of doing these trivial problems like making telecom systems, and they're, they're not very interesting, we can attack some really difficult problems like making music. So this is much more fun. So, so I tweeted, I said, um, so what have these in common? Philip Glass, Thomas Newman, Jan Tiersen, Wagner, Adele, and Beethoven. What have they got in common? They've got legs. What? They've all got legs. Yes. Hands. Yes. Um, and musically, ah. I'm, I'm, I'm... They're musicians. No. Uh, uh, well, composers. Ostinato. Yes! Yes! Ostinato. <laughs> Give us an ostinato. I prepared this. What? Can you do an ostinato? Uh, oh, yeah. Quickly. Who knows what ostinato is? Yes. The Italians will know. Stub <laughs> it's Italian for stubborn, stubbornness, right? And, and it's in the English word obstinate. It's the root of that is ostinato. So ostinato is repeating something again and again and again. And it's a I believe it to be the basis of music. So ostinato is a musical phrase which is repeated many times, OK? So what do we programmers call something that's ostinato. So what a program is called something that's repeated many times. A loop, a for loop, or a while loop, or something like that. So programmers, years before programming languages had invented, or musicians had invented, while loops. Only because there were no programming languages, they didn't know they were while loops. Right. So, ostinato is a while loop. It plays an important part in improvised music. Um, Strictly speaking, it's not, these are from the Wikipedia, strictly speaking, it's not exact repetition. Exact repetition is boring, because 
why do I think this sounds nice? I think it, let's see, is this the next slide? Wait a moment. Something that is repeated time and time again, your brain kind of thinks it's nice because your brain recognizes patterns. There's a musical pattern that repeats and you think it's nice. Um, but if it just repeats, it's boring, so it needs, to, it needs to change slightly. So I was looking at it for examples of this. Uh, so you can see the ostinato. Um, I don't know if you can read music. Um, anybody read music? Good. Well, well done. Okay. For the others who can't read music, music is really easy to read. If we read it from left to right, it's time. So time goes from left to right, and pitch goes up and down. So if the note's written at the top of the store, it's a high-pitched note, and if it's down on the bottom, it's a low-pitched note. And the duration is done by how you filled in the note. So what you can see there... There's one more thing as well, actually, which I think is actually quite beautiful. If you notice, there's actually three sets of lines. Each of those lines is actually concurrency. They're all playing at the same time. So you've yes. got time, you've got pitch, and you've got concurrency. Mm. It, I mean, it's expressing concurrency and parallelism. Sequential code in that direction, concurrent code in that direction. And this is a, this is a, a pattern that repeats. If you look at the top line, you will see it repeats four times, and then it changes slightly. It drops the bottom note, if you look at it. Then it repeats four times, it drops the bottom note. It has a bass note that's going down one at a time, and it sounds like this. Huh? Beautiful. What? There. No! What? Why doesn't it... Go on, play, you bastard. It's <laughs> being recorded, Joe. That's, that's my sound examples. Shit. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'll press the button on it then. This damn bloody keynote. Press the play button, yeah. Press the play button. What's happening? Huh? Oh, we it's coming through this wire here. Are you getting any... It's, it's, look, it's not going... The wire's not going anywhere. This is not... This is, um... <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get sound out of that thing when there's no wire? This is the most important part of this yeah. talk, is the sounds that come out of this frigging thing. We must have pulled it out accidentally. Yeah, right, OK. So let's go back to... <laughs> <laughs> All right, OK. So... And you can see the repetition, that's the ostronato. And you can see the, the falling bass cone. OK, so keep that in your, in your mind. Now, where did Adele get that music from? Where did she get that melody from? And why was it so popular? Because she stole it from Beethoven. Right. So if we look at Beethoven, the Moonlight Sonata, you'll notice exactly the same structure. Uh, almost exactly the same key. She's just added a single sharp to the key, but she's using the same key. These little funny little things at the front tell you whether to sharpen or flatten the note, and it's pretty much the same. This, structurally, is the same as Adele. Which is quite nice. And I'm going to ask the question later, how do we describe this in code? Right. And then... For example, another one that's just repeated in lots of little loops is uh, Philip Glass' um, Morning Passages. <laughs> you weren't expecting dance, were you? It's lovely. I mean, it's beautiful. This is, this is from a film called The Hours, which is a, a wonderful film. And it's the music of Philip Glass. I thought Philip Glass... When I discovered Philip Glass, I thought all this, all this music you hear on, on TV when there's an advertisement is all Philip Glass, but it's not. There's a group of three composers, who all they, they all sound like Philip Glass. Um, uh, Paul Newman, no, what's his name, Newman, and yeah. So, so my theory is that music is reputation plus variation. Our brains like to recognize patterns, and our brains like variation. And these are the minimalists, so Philip Glass, Thomas Newman, Van Tiersen, and Wagner. Now, I thought, well, Wagner was a minimalist. A minimalist is one who repeats things over and over again. Now, how could anybody say that Wagner was a minimalist? By the way, this is where the talk ends, because um, Joe's not going to stop talking about Wagner for the next two hours. So <laughs> just, be, now, just be warned. It, it just so happens I quite like Wagner. Right? <laughs> and and I, was, I was looking about this evidence that Wagner was a minimalist, and I found Friedrich Nietzsche had written that Wagner w w was, was a minimalist. Uh, and why did he say that? Because Wagner's ring cycle is based from these 
like a hundred odd light motif, which are repeated over and over and over and over and over and over again. So it becomes hypnotic. The effect is fantastic. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Uh, as a kind of proof of concept, I wanted to think to myself, can I take an entire work like this and transcribe it easily into musical notation and to something that sounds nice? Uh, shall I play a bit of that? Why not? Okay, so this is... Um, oh, let's see. Oh, you know. Which one? Oh. oh, no, actually, I'll skip over that. I'll skip over that. I think you shouldn't play it, actually, Joe. My no, I, I, I won't. Yeah. It's a good idea, because I can't find out how to do it. Right. But that is something that's going to be my first proof of concept. Can I, can I describe that in an algebraic way that's pretty short and then make make it sound nice. I, it's very important to me that it sounds nice. Right. So I've made a little language. Let me see. It looks kind of like that. If you take the first two bars of I'm going to bake a cake, and you look at the top melody, uh, I just made this little language, C5. C is just the note. 5 is octave 5. At 16, it's a 16th of a note, a semiquaver. Uh, uh, and then there's a... a four because I've changed octave and, and I repeat it 16 times. So it's a kind of simple syntax. And, and uh, yeah, so... Just it's like a compression algorithm, really. Sorry? You're compressing that sequence. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just a simple algorithm. And, and here's sort of just a little fragment of code. Uh, something in brackets or a, a top level, a sequence of things. Is, it means um, sequential composition or sequential. You just play one note after the other, put curly brackets around them. That's sort of a chord. It's not really a chord. It means play these three things inside, starting at the same time. That's all it means. They can be different lengths. And there are various rules about how default values are propagated inside scopes and things. And there's star. Repetition. Re repeat three times, yes. I mean. So it's a very simple programming. But you're language. retreating it three times. Yeah. But that's not music, is it? Is it not? No. Well, what is it? This is music. Oh, Wagner, Wagner. <laughs> is it finished yet? Where's Sam gone? <laughs> I'm hiding from the Wagner. Oh. Firm and masterful as steel. I'll slow it down a little bit, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, this is only 15 and a half hours, so I won't. I, do you want to see it all? <laughs> no. Oh. oh. <laughs> I did warn you. <laughs> okay. So, so what, what did Wagner write? He wrote stuff like this. Okay, it took him 26 years, and it was, some, I think it's 2,000 pages of text. Uh, and if, if you look at the original manuscripts, he wrote this with a little quill pen. <laughs> Poor sod. I mean, it was really, really difficult. And then somebody else had to engrave it and transcribe it. So what do we see here? Well, we see things that are repeated. That's repetition. We see things that are reused once they've been defined. What are they? We've got a name for them. They're called macros or subroutines or something like that. So, so we want a language that we can express music in. It's got to sound nice, though, because if, if we write something in this language and it sounds crap, then, then, then it's no good. Okay. So the next thing is we need it to sound nice. And I don't mean moog nice. I mean moog. I mean moog. Moog, sorry. Yeah. Moog. Apparently, it's pronounced. Well, it's not it's a Moog. It's called Bob Moog who made the synthesizer. Oh, yeah, but I thought it was Moog synthesizer. You see. Right. Yeah. Because. Joe yeah. Armstrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. So what I want is um, a virtual orchestra that I that I have in my front room and and uh, it, it plays various things. So I've got one. I bought a I bought an orchestra. It's about it's about eight hundred kroner or something like that and. Yeah. 
Okay, so that's a virtual orchestra. That so there were no real instruments in that, you're saying? But this is sampled instruments uh, and a, a synthesis program that's playing them back. So the input to that is a stream of MIDI events. The output is music. That's what on earth is a MIDI event? What on earth is a MIDI event? You no, know, you've been I programming know. them for years. I'm just doing this. Okay, so mi uh, MIDI. <laughs> didactic. Well, everybody knows what MIDI events <laughs> are. You're not giving the talk You all know what MIDI events are, don't you? Here. You know, who knows what MIDI events are? Yeah, there you are. They're half not daft. Of the, half of them. So the other half. <laughs> so it's just a very simple protocol for sending messages yeah, yes. from keyboards to synthesizers or from keyboards yes, to other keyboards. Yes, it is. And essentially, it maps onto the keyboard. So you hit a key and it sends a note on event. Yes. You release a key, it sends a note off event. If you hit the key hard, it sends a high velocity, and soft, it sends a low velocity. And there's a bunch of other stuff it does as well, but there's. Uh, from, from what you're doing here, they're the, the main two yeah. events. And, and all these things, all these little boxes, they all talk MIDI. In fact, MIDI is it, MIDI's amazing because if you buy a MIDI device, plug it into your computer, start the browser, it's the only device I know of that can, can send signals out of the machine into external hardware without any fuss. So it's really well supported. It's very old primitive, very, very old. old thing. And just to show it to you, um, this is a standalone, this is a program I, I paid some money for, w which is the ARIA player. And I'm just running it with a little keyboard widget. And this is just about the simplest setup you could have, because it's all in software. And I'll show you that. Uh, here's the, where's the ARIA player? Here's the ARIA player. Oops, no, that's not the ARIA player. Oh, it's right up this end here, like that. That's the ARIA player. And it's got a little keyboard, which, uh, I don't know, playing some piano notes. And it's got, let's see, here's a little keyboard. Here's a little keyboard. And, and if you look at that, you see it says channel, let's say channel one. And I've loaded channel one in the ARIA player with, with the Steinway concert grand piano. And so if we play on the little MIDI keyboard here, it'll play quite decent piano notes. And if I change the channel to two, like that, uh, I've got a, a trombone, OK? So I can load that up with orchestral samples, 16 of them, because there's 16 MIDI channels. And then I can create a program that generates that stuff. And, and we're on the road to being able to produce music with a computer. When Joe says music, he means Wagner, just to be clear. Yeah, well, I, I, as I've explained, music is a Wagner. That's the goal. Because <laughs> my first proof of concept is to do all the Wagner light motifs, so they sound good. Right. OK, so let, let's look at some textual input um, that takes a language like this. It's a stack sort of machine. First of all, we've got this language that describes music. And the output of this phase will be MIDI events, and we'll feed them into the virtual orchestra. Right. So I've got to do make muzzling too to demonstrate this. So we need a shell that should do. We we'll do, yeah, we can do this. Make muzzling two, and off we go. Starting Joe's amazing muzzling two. <laughs> Found Garrett and personal orchestra. Testing that the orchestra players have not fallen asleep. Playing a piano scale. Playing a trombone scale. Playing a Wagnerian riff. Waiting to enter your musical masterpiece. Right. <laughs> oh, a, a round of applause. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and now we've, we've got to this point. So we had a lot of fun choosing what this lady was going to say. Yes, a long yes, time. And, the and choosing the correct voice, muzzling to play. So if we do this like play, uh, piano, and then what do you want to play? Oh, are you asking me? A, B, C. I mean, that's a lovely melody, isn't it? Isn't that beautiful? Splendid. That's about the... Ooh. That's nice, isn't it? Uh, yeah, or we could say, no, I mean, how about C, B, C, E, G? That might be better. Right, there you go. And if you want it as a chord... Can you make it a bit bigger, Joe, so people can see? Uh, can you see it? Sorry. No. Oh, oh dear. Oh. oh, well. Let's just make the window bigger. Yeah, and okay. Then yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. OK. We need to scroll up a bit. Yeah. Let's uh, move the window up a bit. Oh, what happened there? No, don't do this to me. 
Okay. Oh, where's the fucking stuff? Okay. What? Oh, no, well, that's not. Square jar, by the way, so you get a pound per, yeah. per square no, jar. Right. So that's just a little chord. So you want to repeat it ten times, I do. So I said. Works. And then if you want to put that in a, in a, so well maybe you want to play something you want to play, I don't know, you want to play uh, a C and an E and a G uh, like that and you want to do that and you want to do that and you want to do this and you want to do that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, let's put that. Um, hundred times. No, no, because it, it'll take too long. We'll be a, I mean, it's not it'll be as long as bloody Wagner if you do all that stuff. There you go, something like that. I mean, it's not the best tune in the world. <laughs> right, so, so that's, that's, if you like, the, the programmatic way of getting into this program. Oh, and, and it's going to be one good of the starting points. It's a good starting point. So that's not the only way. Let's go back to the slides. So, where the hell are the slides gone? There. Oh, well, that's music. Window. There we go. And play again. So there we have one or two little sound samples. Okay, so I also wanted to, I want to have multiple representations for different users and for different purposes. So I thought, well, how do you, how would you edit this stuff and turn it into musical notation? So I thought, well, it's quite, the browser is actually quite easy to work with. So, so I thought I'd stick this stuff in the browser and run it here. So we've got a little thing in the browser. Let's see if it works. Uh, and this, you can move the focus of attention of the notes and flatten them and sharpen them and move, move, move them up and down. And uh, well, I'll take out the accidental. Move that. Yeah, we move, 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 move this note down and then move, sharp, flatten it and sharpen it. And then maybe I want to move, wait a moment, I want to move all the notes. And we could connect that to some proper musical instruments. So it sounds okay. So, so we could do that as well. And then, of course, we want musical notation to come out of it. Uh, and of course, wait a moment. Uh, oh, what, uh, what would that? What do you mean by musical notation? Well, proper, proper manuscripts that musicians can play. So we want to write stuff like that. Now, uh, as a typist, if you think typesetting text is easy, this is my proof of concept to typeset that. I mean, if I could typeset that, uh, as you might realize, these are difficult sub-problems. <laughs> this is a sub-problem. It's not the main problem. I mean, this bit here, wait a minute, how do you highlight this? Which bit? That bit. <laughs> that bit. That bit. That bit. Can you play that bit on, on your thing? No, but I can play that bit. Do you know somebody has actually fed this into a synthesizer and can play this stuff? Does that sound good? No, it sounds bloody awful, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> But it's really, this, this music, this guy, um, what's his name? John Stump. Google John Stump if you want to find the most beautiful music manuscript, the most beautiful music engraving on the planet. Nobody actually knows if John, it's, it's cool, John Stump, if you Google him, you'll find an obituary, and you'll find all these documents written by his, apparently his children, but there is apparently no evidence that he actually lived. So, so we don't know if John Stump lived or not. It's, it's a bit of a bit of a surprise. So let's go back to this. What are we doing? I That's a good talk. question. What are we doing? I don't know. We're in a talk. Is it, is it clear what we're doing? Uh, yeah, I kind of lost somewhere. Wait a moment. So let's go back to this and play. Yeah, so, so we've got this browser input. Yep. Oh, wait a moment. And I haven't said that's, t that's text input. So you can textually input it. The browser input. Visual input. Yeah, I mean, in this kind of thing. And then there's, of course, keyboard input. When we connect a MIDI keyboard, just play it in. And then, so what problems do I want to solve? What, what, what are the primitives I need? Let's see. So for inputs, I want text. I want the browser or the keyboard. For outputs, I want synthesizers, synthesized music, orchestras, all this kind of stuff here. Funny. Moogs. Is that right? Um, strong. How do you pronounce it? Moog. Like oh, Moog. Moog. 
Yeah. But in rogue. Rogue. Rogue yeah. with an M. Yes. Yeah, rogue with an M. And I want, I want output synthesizer Moog outputs. <laughs> and, and I want engraving. And, and I want some tools. Uh, recording, post-editing, improving, and taking over. Um, I've been thinking about taking over for years. Taking over would be, I, I want to play like, get the MIDI thing for Rachman and Oster Piano Concerto. And, and it's really, you know, it, it starts really da, 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 da. It's really easy. It's just octaves. And then it goes, <laughs> it goes completely berserk. So my idea there was, if we can synchronize the music there, just by watching what I'm doing, and then at the point where I give up, it, the computer just sort of takes over for a bit. <laughs> and, and, and does the hard bits for you. It does the hard bits for you. What have we all got computers for? I mean, musicians all over the world would thank me for that. Think these bloody concert pianists. They could just do da 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 da, da and then move their hands. And if they moved the piano so you couldn't see their fingers on the keyboard, this could be really big. It could be great. Cheating, Joe, cheating. Cheating? Cheating. Helping. <laughs> The other thing I thought, which I uh, could try and build, was I, I, as a music improver, because when I'm practicing the piano, uh, Sam said I should have a log of everything. I don't have a log of everything I do. So if I practice piano for an hour, I have to have a MIDI file log that logs this, and I thought, wait a moment, I'm practicing the same bars over and over again. Sometimes I play it correctly, other times I play it incorrectly. And I thought, well, the correct notes probably are the same each time, and the incorrect notes are probably random. So if I can sync it and average them, I could have like a button that goes, improve. <laughs> <laughs> and it would come out beautiful. It'd be lovely. Yeah, lovely. And, and, I, and I reckon, realistically, th this is the sort of program we could probably write in between five and 10 years, I should think. For sure. Yeah, if we give enough conferences so we have those little conference book development days before the... Before yes, we'll get there. The we'll, get there. We'll, get there. we'll get there. Oh, yeah. Not that, though. Yeah, no. Uh, yep, okay. So Sonic Line 3, uh, Rogue Mode. Oh, yeah, Rogue Mode. Yeah. This is now sort of another lecture. Do you know how I do lectures? You see, I give the last lecture I gave, which was in London, Code Mesh. We did a thing together. And I take that lecture and then edit it with some stuff in the front. So you've got the old lectures at the end in case you want to use bits of it. So, so this was the roadmap for the last day. I tell him how to use Sonic Pocket. Last you remember? Very yep. good. We've, so we've come on since then. Fab. And we had a goal. Make it distributed. In the last one, it was make it distributed. And we, we so, so far, you've been doing it all on one machine. So far, we've been doing it all on one machine. And here, 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 here there, there many cables. is a distribution cable. <laughs> it's a magic cable. Ooh. And you can send music down the cable. Isn't that nice? Isn't that marvelous? Oh, you mean like you can sing down the end? Mm. Like here? Mm. And then Sam can start a program over there on his thing, yep. which is connected to a Moog synthesizer. <laughs> and we can take the muzzlang, and instead of piping it to my little orchestra, which I've got my virtual orchestra sitting inside my computer just waiting to obey me, I can send the music down the wire wow. to you. Great. Yeah. Should we try that? Yep. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, do you think it'll work? It's going to work. You sure? No. No, no, I'm not. Right. <laughs> but it's, well, I mean, most of these things have actually worked so far. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've written the code, I'm quite confident. Yeah. It's running already. <sighs> yeah. Right, okay, we're off. We're off. We've got a chair. Kill. Oh, bloody hell, which window? And you can, you can play with these knobs. Oh, play can these I? knobs. Oh, wait a moment. Let's see. Right. Talk. Uh, B. So can, can we have both the screens at once? Is that possible? No, no, no that's that. not in that window. Because I'd already started it to avoid to save time. Are we in? Yeah, we're in that window. So we've already started it, and let's do this. Because I'm now sending them down the wire. Playing a Wagnerian riff. So we need to change the knobs. Oh, that's better. Twiddle the knob so it sounds like Wagner. Metropolitan Orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> 
but it's not passion there. You know what it needs? It needs a drum that's synced to the beat. We could do that. Well, we can't do that right now, because we haven't got the right tempo. Well, we almost got it right. We've almost is it, got is it, it yeah. worth showing we almost got it right? Well, actually, I think I probably could do a drum at the same time. Let's just try that let's out. Let's see if that works. Uh, there are timing issues. Timing is really hard. Timing is really hard. Really and Erlang does timing very well. Perhaps. So does Sonic Pi. Does yeah. Ruby. Well, Sonic Pi does timing really well, and Erlang does timing really well, <laughs> but they can't agree on what the time is. <laughs> try it again, Joe. See if we can, see if we can uh, okay. get some drums. So let's, let's do this. Let's Playing a Wagnerian riff. Is that what you want? More like a club no, no, track. No. This is this needs a bit of work on it. How are we doing time wise? <laughs> when do we finish? I have no idea. Does anybody know when we finish? Somebody. How long have we been on? It's, it's now oh we've got twenty minutes left, twenty two minutes left. Oh, we're crikey. good, we're good. Twenty two oh, I'm run out of stuff, I think. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's Wagner. No, that's Wagner. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, no, no, I've got nothing to do if that sounds like Wagner. I, I've got all this stuff to do. I mean, an awful lot of work. You, you don't know how busy I am with this stuff. I mean, it's really, I haven't got time to do anything else. Uh, look at my slides. Uh, no, uh, I don't think so. Because I think I was going to do the first half and you were going to do the second half. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to rehearse it together and go through it once. Because Monica said we should rehearse it. <laughs> did we rehearse it? We did bit? rehearse it a few times, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, bit, well, bit. well, our idea of rehearsing it was to make sure the programme's compiled and maybe run them once. Maybe it might make sense to summarise what you just said. Sorry? If you summarise what you've just said, then I maybe I'll uh, explain it. Yes, okay. So, so what? one of the long... If, have you noticed the way that we've... I've been addressing this problem is, is with... I think this slide would kind of give you the notion of it, because this is kind of the essence of things. We built a small components that do one thing well. This, this orchestra only can play musical samples. You send it MIDI events, play note on channel one, stop playing note on channel one, and controller changes. It doesn't do anything else at all. This, this keyboard thing only sends events to something. It's a widget, it does one thing, and it does it well. A keyboard does one thing, and it does it like that. Uh, and what we want, I've just recently, Sam came and showed me a graphical widget. It's the best GUI I've ever seen. I mean, it's actually really good. What's it called? This um, InScore. InScore. InScore is amazing. It's a research project in France. And the GUI is super, super good. Should I run InScore? You've got time, yeah, you've got time. Well, I've got time, yeah. I don't know if I can. My half the talk went no, 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 but just, 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 just sort of talk to yourself. No, but, but wait a moment. Where are our file browser? Yeah, there you go. Because it is an in, here's an InScore directory. And if you start in, wait a minute, let's see. What, I don't know what happens if you click on these. You're welcome to. Oh, that was my first in. Oh, shut up. Uh, do you want to open it? If yeah, oh yes, I do. Uh, but I was going to wanted to show you what. Oh, forget it. I can't show you. I, I was playing with it. But InScore is wonderful because it's the only GUI I know. When you start it, it has no menus. It has no control. It has no nothing. No, it has absolutely nothing, uh, and it just pops up a window. That's it, and it doesn't do anything at all. And and it sits there and it says, "Send me messages." Well, it doesn't even say that. You have to know. Uh, you send it messages. And what do you send it? You send it UDP messages to port 7000, which contain scalable vector graphics, and it prints them. So That's this brilliant. This, this purple text wasn't there. You had to send the message. No, I have to send a, a load of a bundle of messages to do that. But this means it's a completely isolated widget. It doesn't do anything at all, right? That's really useful for things that don't do anything, but you can remote control them. And if you look at Sonic Pi, and uh, Sam will show you that, I'll, I'll just show you what, we're, what I like to do. If you look at a program like this, I don't want to be nasty about it, so I won't be nasty about it. Where has it gone? Let's take somebody like this, Logic Pro. 
Okay, so this is a typical program. This is actually a very good program. I, I won't fault it on that, but but look look at this thing. I mean, let's see. Is it? Oh, I don't know what's happening. These these are called digital audio workstations. They are just about the most complicated programs on the planet. Using them is, is, is once you've learned one, you've got to find out where all the frigging menus are. There are things hidden in menus ten levels deep, and this is because. The notion that these people have are that the people who are going to use these things cannot program at all. They cannot express anything in code. So everything you have to do has to be done by clicking the mouse and dragging it and stretching it and doing horrible things. They are appallingly bad interfaces for somebody who knows how to program. So I mean, if I've got, a, if I say, "Oh, I hear this little melody," da 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 da, repeated four times, da, 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 brackets, comma, four in an interface that's just got one window and I type text in and it type sets it and plays it and does everything. And we want to turn the architect, we want to keep the simplicity of Sonic Pi so that we can teach it to children. But when you open it up and look at how it's built under the, under the counter, I want to make it out of these message passing components. So you're not saying specifically that the graphics are bad? No. It's just that when you actually try and throw all the things, the interaction and the display in the same place, yes. it can get extremely complicated. Yes. Yeah. So, so Sam will tell you a bit about the Sonic Pi's architecture. I mean, it's built from the Super Collider and various. Do you want to tell them about that, or, yeah, or yeah, you want to yeah. show them? Maybe you show them because yeah. results are always good. We've got, uh, what can you do with it? Fifteen minutes left. Can you see the Sonic Pi stuff? Yeah. yeah. Is it best to have black or white? What's, the, what's your preference? Black. black. So this is the nightclub mode. Um, uh, so if you're in schools, you often use this. But in, in nightclub, I, I did a performance where I only had the white, and the, the people said it's lovely, but it's just too bright. So we have the nightclub mode. Um, and so Sonic Pi is just an editor, and it's trying to be like Joe's saying. It's, the, it's, <coughs> a, it's a simple environment, and you can send messages to it. Um, and also it's an editor as well, because what you really want is to make sure that uh, new users can just work straight away with it. So I don't know if you've used, any of you used music coding systems before? There's a whole bunch of really cool languages out there that can make music with text, a variety of different languages, like Haskell ones, and Clojure ones, and... Uh, uh, Ruby ones and Lua ones. What tends to happen is they, they work like a nice library for the language, but to use it, you need to build, bring in your own editor in your own environment. So for you guys and ladies, that's not necessarily a problem because you're already programmers, so you're very used to using quite sophisticated environments to manipulate text. Right? That's your job. Um, but if we're trying to... Uh, um, the, what's important to stress here is that, that uh, we haven't really sort of d discussed our audience. So Joe's really talking about what he would like to do in terms of Wagner, uh, and but the simplification is important as well because it, it, what that allows you to do is it allows you to uh, to engage a broader audience. So once you've got a simple language, hopefully you can get more people using it. Um, and so with Sonic Pi, my audience isn't just people like yourselves who are already programmers. My audience is actually not you, really. It's everybody else who can't program. Because what I'm trying to do is to demonstrate the creativity of code. I'm trying to lower the barrier to entry specifically to the creativity of code. And so if your barrier to entry is open Emacs, it's not going to really work, is it, you know? Um, and so or co even compiling a program is already a lot of work because you've got to open a terminal, you've got to write the compile things, you've got to open a shell, it's, which maybe if you're a professional programmer are very trivial activities to do, but for non-programmers, each of these activities becomes a barrier. And after one or two, they're just not interested. You need to lower that barrier. Well, what so I was yeah. going to say is, is a lot of components we build what we want to build, the architecture we want, is a pure message pass component-based architecture. So what will go into these things are messages. You can think of them as MIDI messages going in and MIDI messages going out and knob messages controlling it. So, so if you had the abstraction of this, there'd be MIDI going in, MIDI going out, uh, control signals controlled by knobs. These would be standard components. They communicate using UDP and they're encoded in this open sound control language. Now this is a very, very simple language. And, and the nice thing about that is we can, we can make the baggage and the infrastructure so that you can write these in Erlang or Alexia or Ruby or Python or Perl or any bloody language you feel like. Sure. And then, then, then you have the next level of abstraction is wiring these things together. And, and, and that's where we, we're not... If you're yet. a programmer, and what I'm trying to talk about here um, is that there are a lot of people who aren't programmers yet. Yeah. And so we want to try and make sure that their barrier to entry is low. And so I think that, 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 that once you can program, then you can start to do all these things. But yes. if you can't program, you need an environment that you can just open up straight away and type stuff in and run the code and get errors straight away. So this is what Sonic Pi is trying to be. Um, and so I go into schools and just get them to write something like this.
and then they can make some sounds. Um, and so this is a, the simplest program I can think of making it work. But what's fun now is like typically in schools, I would just talk about abstractions and functions, right? Play is a function, 70 is an abstraction, it's a number that can go up and go down. Abstractions really map onto other things in the world, pitch happens to go up and down. So because we've got that isomorphism between the two things, we can now choose a higher number and guess what? Get a higher note, right? So we can get into the kids here. But what's actually fun at this point, I think, because we've gone through all this talking about message passing and open sound control and MIDI, what actually happens here is when I run that code, that text is in the GUI, okay? I run the code, the GUI then takes that text and sends it to the network to a, to a server, which then evaluates that code. The evaluation of that code does a whole bunch of stuff figuring out what the parameters are, because I'm triggering synthesizers. There's lots of default parameters and then sends another message to another process. So there's three separate processes involved, which is the super collider synthesis engine, which then plays the sound. And so we actually start to talk about the fact that we actually have a nice, like you were talking before, about this message in, message out. Already with this line of code, we've got three separate processes passing messages between each yeah. other. Now, what's really fun is that we don't necessarily have to send the messages within the machine itself. I can send messages to external devices. So instead of saying, play, I can say MIDI E1, and that will now send a message to my synthesizer, which you can hear. And this isn't played in SuperCloud. It's not, the sound isn't coming from the computer. The sound is coming from the synthesizer. Actually, both of these synthesizers are played at once. So in this case, what's happening is the GUI is sending the text to the Ruby server. The Ruby server then is evaluating the text, saying, you want to play a MIDI note. It's then sending a message to Erlang, Erlang is then scheduling that message to happen at the right time, thanks to Joe's lovely code. That message then goes to another process, which turns the, the open sound control protocol into something called MIDI, which we discussed before, which then goes out to these devices. So we have this nice sort of function pipeline of, of processes all communicating with each other nicely over simple protocols. Yeah. And, and another thing I, I would like to say is, is people talk about building systems out of multiple languages. This is actually built using C++, Ruby, GUI, yeah, Erlang, server. Uh, in the scheduler, and the closure for the synthesizer designs. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then the super collider was written in C++. These are actually pretty complicated programs, and they're all interfacing together very nicely. But they don't—they're not linked together. That's the big mistake. If you link things together, they run in the same memory space, so errors can propagate between one of them. They're done properly with message passing components between them. But Joe, you write yes, and probably F sharp as well. Yeah, but I didn't show you the sharp. It's a, it's a sharp on the keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, so what I'm showing now is how to Fire. generate events from Sonic Pi out to the system. Shop. But earlier, Joe was sending me messages from his Muslang 3, 4, 5, which three. version is it? 3, um, four, down, three this, yeah. down this data wire to my system. And what's interesting to see here, this is the latest version. On the bottom right, you can see this thing moving around. Can you see that? So when I control uh, uh, con uh, uh, um, devices which are connected to Sonic Pi, automatically all the events go in. Yeah, knob variables. Knob variables, uh, absolutely. And what's, what, what I think is quite interesting is this is an event log. It's a persistent event log that allows pattern matching over it. Um, and it's the complete memory of all the events which are into the system. And so I can not just go back in time and replay events. I can wait for the next event. I can see the previous event. I can see event from, from five minutes ago. I can see the sequence from the last bar. So there's lots of really fun things you can do when you have this persistent event store. Uh, and what we were doing before was we, Joe was sending these messages. And so maybe, Joe, if you can send the messages again. Yep. Uh, so you'll be able to see in the event log, uh, if I, if you. If you ready? Yep. Okay. Playing a Wagnerian riff. So you can see the messages coming in from Joe's system. Now you can't see any code because that was already run and evaluated in a different buffer, um, but you can actually see what's going on. And actually the code which is running is this. So this is, this is what you're hearing. Uh, and so this is the Sonic Pi doing some, something a bit more non-trivial than just play 60 or MIDI 4. Um, in this case, we've got two, two things. The first one is this lexical closure here, this reverb closure, basically sets up a reverb context which adds echoey sounds and then have these two live audio functions, which are reading audio from the sound card, uh, and then just piping out to the sound card. So if you've got a multi-channel sound card with 16 inputs and guitars and singers, then you can start using input one, input two, 
uh, and, and pipe them out, and you give them each a separate name. So this just sets up Sonic Pi to read audio from two channels in, add reverb, and then output it to the standard channel. So that allows me to hear the synthesizers. But they're not being triggered. They need to, be, you need to send these MIDI events out. So this is what these live loops are. Now, live loops are very similar to Erlang processes. They just run. They're a, they're a, a thread a construct. They're just using Ruby threads. But they're also this looping structure. So it's like a, it's a process in Erlang which calls a function which is tail recursive, which calls itself. Um, but it has a special property that the tail recursive call, the end of the function, uh, uses the namespace. So it dereferences the function every time. So it allows you actually, between iterations, to modify the behavior as it's playing. We'll see what that means in a second, but that allows you to live code. And then we've got this, uh, what you would call receive in Erlang, sync I call in Sonic Pi, because it's sort of syncing with music. Uh, I'm syncing on this incoming message, which matches what you can see in the, in the event queue on the right-hand side. So I'm waiting for that message to come in, and then I'm pulling out the two values that Joe is sending to me. One is this MIDI channel, which I'm not doing anything with, and then two, the, the B is the notes. Because um, this is just Erlang with a, a crappy syntax, basically. Yeah, you can you can be offensive if you want, but uh, <laughs> it works. And uh, it <laughs> yeah, what it doesn't have is it doesn't have pattern matching on the left hand side, which would would be beautiful to be perfectly honest. Um, and at this point, what this does, which Erlang doesn't do, Joe. What? Um, so Erlang syncs and waits for an event to come in, right? That's yeah. important. So typically, when we're programming, what we care about, especially in concurrency, is do a bunch of stuff, wait for it to finish, and then do some more stuff, right? But don't do this until this is finished. So you can send a message to say, I've done my things. You can carry on. Um, so this, this does that. But it also, in that message to say, I'm ready, it sends a logical clock. So what we care about in music isn't that I do this when you've finished. I care about I do it on beats when you've finished. And so it's really important not just to wait till something's happened before you start, but actually to start at the same time. So this implicitly shares these logical clocks, which now means that uh, Sample now inherits the logical clock of the message that came in. Uh, I'm playing this bass drum house, which is with a, with a drum sample, and the MIDI note on message to my synthesizers. Note that, um, and that's matching the note on, and I've got one for the note off as well. So I've got, in this case, uh, I've got two threads running at once. This one just sets the context up and finishes. And these are actually persistent um, running threads, one for the note off messages, one for the note on messages. And uh, then they sent the message out, and then the audio comes in, and then we add reverb. So we're starting to see now actually quite a sophisticated example where we're using multi-channel MIDI, multi-channel audio all at the same time. But each of these constructs here, and this is really key for, for schools, I can teach to a 10-year-old child. This is really, really important. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so oh, we've got five minutes left. At this point, I think it's really important to, uh, to, to talk about these, these, the syncing, but also the live loop structures as well. Because when Joe's sending these messages in, and if you can, if you can send the send things again, you. yeah. Playing a Wagnerian riff. So I'm okay. I can delete the drums, and they're gone, right? Or I can add the drums back in, and it just works, right? I can I can change this to something else. What else do I want? Like a, a elect beat, whatever, right? And so what I'm able to do with this live loop is I'm able to modify its behavior as it's running. And what's really important is it's not losing any time because I'm threading this logical clock so through so the thread. So you've discovered live code upgrade. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But <laughs> temporal. 30, 30 years after we... Temporal live code upgrade, Joe. So yeah, it's not oh, just we about we didn't do modifying the behavior. It's also making sure they're in time. Yeah. And, and what does that really mean? Right? So let's, let's say I have like a live loop called Foo. And here I'm playing a sample called Loop Industrial, right? And I'm... Beat stretching out to one bar, and I'm sleeping for one, right? That's right. Right. Lovely, right? And then I have another live loop called, I don't know, uh, Beats, and I'm just playing sample bass drum house like this, and I'm sleeping for half a beat. Now I've got these two things at the same time. You can hear what that sounds like, like this. That's without the drum, this is with the drum, right? So what's, what's interesting is when you're performing, you're doing this kind of modification, but you also do this, right? And you, and you break the thread. And so at this point, oh, now I've broken it. I need to fix it. So I delete the mistake. And I started again. It doesn't sound quite right. Can, it, can you hear that? It doesn't sound right. So this is where, this is the difference between, say, an Erlang approach and the Sonic Pi approach is, 
what Erlang would care about is I'm running the threads again. So I'm able to stop, I'm able to deal with the recovery, I'm able to recover, the other threads are still running, my whole system hasn't come down, I'm still, people can still dance to the, the, the things which are still running. I'm able to recover from the error, restart the thread, and I'm off again, that's great, but it sounds rubbish because they're not in synchronization with each other. Right? And that's what you care about in music. You don't typically care about that in lots of other programming contexts, but music you do. And so this, this thread system we talked about, so the, the event system coming in, I can use within the system itself. It doesn't have to be from Joe's machine or the MIDI devices. I can actually, these live loops, when they go around, you can see on the right-hand side, they're sending these Q slash foo and Q slash, Q slash beats events internally. And so what I can actually do is I can make a mistake, blow up the thread, delete it, but ask it to synchronize on foo, right? So what it's going to do now is it's going to receive, it's going to wait, and come back in time, right? So I'm able to, to not just have multiple threads running simultaneously, recover from, from error, but also I'm able to bring the threads back in synchronization so broadly. A conductor? Yes, precisely. A Wagner yes. and orchestra, you go, boom, from there, or they all play at the same time. It's wonderful. And the, the cool thing is now we've worked on this dis distribution thing, the same system that I'm working internally to do this, I can actually start syncing across with multiple machines uh, and then start to think about having a band of these things and also have it in different cities. So we can be, I can be in Cambridge, you can be in Stockholm, we can sort of jam together. And we can distribute the control. Yep, we're going to have 15 hours of, of uh, the audience can be, can be changing what's happening. Absolutely. Does that make sense? So we're not just, not, not just caring about concurrency here, which we really do care about, we're also really caring deeply about time and what that might mean, mm -hmm. and making sure that that's threaded within the language, but also in a way that you don't have to explicitly talk about it as much as you might do in other systems, because we want to make it simple enough for 10-year-old kids. And, and, and in this case, what I find super interested in is that kids would, when I would give a like, lesson, they do play, whatever, 70, seat for one, play for whatever, 60, 75, and and then they would loop, loop this, great. And this would be their program they would write within a couple of hours. And then they would write another program. Let's comment this out. And then let's write another program. Uh, oh, didn't paste it. Come on, Sam. There we are. Let's comment this one out. And this one is doing uh, that sample. Bass drum house. And then seat for half a beat. So we have two loops, right? And so they would, within the first few hours of working with kids, they want to do this, right? And they run it, and obviously it's not playing them both at the same time, is it? Because obviously you all can all clearly see we're in an imperative context. The loop is like a black hole that sucks the programming context in and doesn't let it go. So the program never gets out of that first loop to play the second loop. And so this is, I, find this, I find this really fascinating because the, the kids would say, how do I do this? And I'm in a school, and there's a very clear computer science curriculum that's been created by the government and that, that says what the kids should learn, and that's really it. It has to be inside this box. And that list does not include concurrency. <coughs> it does not include distributed programming. It doesn't include event logging. It doesn't include, include sending messages across networks, right? And so the answer, if I'm being a, a strict teacher in teacher mode, is sorry, you can't do that, <laughs> right? And that's a problem because kids don't like the answer, <laughs> but you have to say that because the teacher's not going to, to listen to, oh, let's do threads, right? Because they haven't got time. It's not there's space in their lesson <coughs> plan. So this is where, as a programmer, you sneak in things, right? So this is where the alive loop came in because you just, just change it to a live loop and then run it and oh, you get an error because live loops are musicians and musicians have names. So this one's Sam and this one's Joe. And now they're playing at the same time. So this is a case where you can sort of sneak in these constructs in a way that the teachers don't realize you're doing concurrency. The kids are happy, right? But the, the syntax is pretty much identical, but the semantics are actually much more <laughs> rich and interesting. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Well, <laughs> oh, it's just cool. You don't like the syntax? Well, you're an Erlang programmer, so. No, no, I, I, I like the semantics. I mean, right. I, I just think it's nice. Yeah, okay. It's good stuff. Yeah, there's this thing called Elixir, Joe. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice, nice syntax. Yeah. Not, not too different. And, and I, I, I was thinking, I mean, this is, this is uh, I, I was struck by Justin's talk, the keynote this morning, and he said, you know, you write a program and a, a light, you know, there's a button or a light that flashes. I mean, 
not a button to press. Can, can we, we could do this, all right. Now look press, at press some buttons. Look at this thing. I mean, press the buttons see the to events, press. You can see the events coming in the bottom yeah. right. Ask Mono and Grid key. So now I need to create a live loop called Foo. I synchronize on what's coming in, Mono and Grid key. Any old. And I'm going to do a sample bass drum Harris, like we saw before. Now you can press it. Which one? Any. Any? Any. Any. All of them, yeah. I can't press all of them. Well, you could if you wanted to. No, I haven't. Yeah, it does. Okay. Ooh. Now, I notice there's a delay there because Solid Pi automatically has this latency to make sure the timing is working. So I can actually change it to say, uh, use real time. Now it's doing it for note on and off. So I can actually just pull out the x, the y, and the value of this. And oh, x, y, value equals sync. And then I can say on v do this. Now you've got only when you press it. Lovely. But a bass drum on its own is not so fun. So I could play like a, oh, you could do, you can change the pitch. So you can do R pitch three. It's going to go up to three seven tones. No, when you move the. Oh, you want it on the, actually on, to on the Y value. Okay. Go. Hey, we've invented a new musical instrument. Right? So you can do something like that. What's also quite fun, I, I just show this, this, this is wicked, right? So <laughs> he's going. What I can do is I can pull in external samples I, I bought, like this E bit. It's like the Nibelung. You know, yeah, you can play it. It's a Wagner machine. <laughs> so I can actually play like a hey, full. Can, can you make it sound like a trumpet? Uh, full an sample. Anvil. It's an anvil, it's got to be. I can't really do that. Oh, yeah. do so here I've got um, a full sample, right? Which is not what you're wanting, because I <coughs> right, just start again. But what you can do is, with, when you're working with programming <coughs> languages, it's really fun to think of these abstractions, is that I've got that full sample of all the drums. Oh, I've stopped the program. Um, but actually what I want to do is play one of the drums, like maybe the second or the first or the third. So I can say onset Y, which is the Y value coming in, and now I've got different drums on here, and I can do that with arpeggiators here. So you can start to really play around. So is that your anvil? Is that good enough? I can change on the pitch by Y. So but you can start to see how, with a very small amount of code, you can start to do interesting interactions between external devices and the sound. Um, and the cool thing is now is that we have, instead of just doing the sounds and doing MIDI, we can send arbitrary messages across the network, and they're all very well timed. So you have an endpoint, you write Erlang, we can send you messages to that, and we can trigger your lights if you've got on a Raspberry Pi. We can trigger your whatever you want to do, your spinning things or whatever, in a very well-timed yeah, We connect the light. lights in so they dim when, when the... DMX, Joe, you know, that's, that's oh. the future of lights. Yeah, so we could totally do like DMX things and, and control the whole light rigs. Control stuff. the lifts. Well, if, you are, if your lift has an API, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, we're good? Cool. Yeah, cool. cool. So are we done? Oh, well, we I mean, I don't know, it's Francesco's does that have like, did that have any kind of like a narrative to it? I'm not sure. I don't know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> this is work in progress, you know. So absolutely, uh, uh, we, we haven't sort of. So, so from my perspective, what I'm what I'm fascinated by the fact is that that the more I look at Erlang, the more I see really lovely semantics that I'm I have already in Sonic Pi in a really naff way, which I'm learning how to improve. But I'm also extending the Erlang parts. And so, if anyone wants to actually help me and work on this. You could, if you're a Ruby programmer, you can get involved. If you're C++ programmers, you can get involved. But if you work on the Beam, you can also get involved yeah. as well. And, and, and what I see from my point of view is, is an incredible amount of hard work that's done in, in the back end of the synthesizer. This stuff is by no means easy. And if you think it's difficult to do it on one machine, making it multi-platform so it runs on Windows, Linux, and, and OS X is it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a bugger of a lot of work. For a specific uh, definition of yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But you've already filled the swear box, so I can't say anything. Yeah, no, but it is, it, 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 it is an awful lot of work to make this stuff work. But I, I think if we can, the nicest thing about Sonic Pi, well, I mean, the end result, the, the totality of it is very good, but the architecture is such that it, that it can be it's extensible. It's extensible architecture yeah. based on message passing. And I think it's the most complex message passing application I've ever seen. This is far more complicated than a telephone exchange. Oh, that's, that sounds good to me. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, but that's done with hundreds of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, we're done? I'm done, thank we're you. We're done, thank you.